The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, welcome back. Um, <clears throat> so last time, I tried to um, ease us into a, a, a switch in thinking from instead of trying to explicitly solve the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, I wanted to try thinking about a different class of algorithms which we called policy search, where you explicitly parameterize your control system with some parameters and then just search in the space of parameters for a good solution, okay? So, um, The idea was let's go ahead and define, you know, some class of control systems by some parameter vector, right? And then our optimal control problem, which is which we called, you know, sort of minimizing uh, uh, j pi of x not T, we could think of as explicitly minimizing um, over that vector alpha something that if I shorthand pi of alpha with just alpha of x0 t. <clears throat> and if you're willing to, um, to restrict your thinking to a single initial condition, <coughs> then you can really just think of it as I've got some old function j of alpha and I want to minimize it with respect to alpha. Okay? That puts you squarely in the land of you can call f min in MATLAB. You can do sort of any old optimization um, on it. <clears throat> okay? So today I, I said we're, the, the lecture is called trajectory optimization. I tried to point out that thinking about this policy search, that could be a general thing. That could encompass, um, you know, feedback policies. For instance, this could be parameterized by, you know, if K is filled out with alphas, that's, that's okay. And I also said it could be um, open loop trajectories, right? In general, I could just ignore X and it could just be, um, let me see how I wrote it last time. It could just be, let's say, um, that u at time t is just alpha of n, where n equals some floor of d over dt. I'm not sure that's the best way to write it, but that's, a, I think, a clean way to write it. Okay. So what does that mean? That means that my control policy over time is just um, a, a set of, it's a, it's a zero order hold trajectory, right? Where each of these are, are dt long. And this one is alpha one, this one's alpha two, and so on, right? <coughs> So if I'm willing to make some sort of simple um, tape of trajectories, right, that are parameterized by these alphas, and naturally you can do a, a cleaner job of doing this with splines or, or whatever, but let's think about the simple representation. Then solving this min alpha j alpha is equivalent to trying to find the open loop trajectory that I'd like to follow, which minimizes j, right? For instance, for some initial, for, for a particular initial condition. Okay, so that class is this um, sort of the open loop um, family of, of control policies is special enough that there's a lot of methods that are that are highly tuned for that 
open loop trajectory optimization. Okay. So I want to I want to talk about a few of them today. They're very powerful. They tend to scale to nice to fairly high dimensional systems, um, and I actually think they can be used as a part of a process to design good feedback controllers. But that's a that's a longer story. Let me just tell you today how to solve open loop trajectories. <clears throat> okay. Um, in the trajectory optimization world, there's roughly, well, there's lots of ideas. And so, so many ideas actually that I might, it's going to slip into Tuesday, I decided. All right. But um, uh, let me tell you about the first two of them today. Um, I want to talk about first shooting methods. And then direct co-location methods. And I've got lots of half-baked examples that were coded in the middle of the night, so to to hopefully bring the message through. <coughs> okay, so what's the shooting method? Um, you might be able to guess. Shooting methods are, well, how many people know? How many people know what shooting methods are? Excellent, okay. How would you characterize a shooting method? What would you? States from the hope from the beginning time and the coast states from the end time and hope they match up in the middle or something. Perfect. Well, yeah. So, so I mean, in general, actually, so um, it's even simpler than that. Uh, in general, so shooting methods are often the title for solving boundary value problems, which is what you just said, right? The name comes from boundary value problems. We can use them more generally. Um, even if it's just initial, an initial value problem. But the basic idea is exactly what you said. Let's just simulate the system with the parameters we have, and then work to change our parameters, shoot a little bit different place, right? So let's say we have uh, um, t over x for some very simple system. Um, <coughs> and I run my controller from initial conditions here, and I get some trajectory with alpha equals 1, let's say, or even alpha equals some, some lar long vector, right? Maybe it's 1, 2, 43, 6. I get that. <coughs> and let's say my goal is to get my final conditions to be here. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to change alpha and run it again shooting successively until I get to my desired fi final value. If I change alpha, then maybe my controller gets me here. And if I change it again, maybe it'll get me all the way up to the, the, the goal. Right? I see a... Uh, yeah? Okay, I'll tell you the update. Yeah. Um, but the big idea is I'm going to take some, um, I'm going to try to solve a, a problem, for instance, a boundary value problem by starting with some initial conditions, simulating, and just changing them parameters. Okay? <clears throat> so you can imagine if the thing you're trying to solve is not explicit, I mean, a boundary value problem is, uh, is obviously one thing we can do, but maybe you also have a cost that you're trying to optimize over that, then uh, um, the basic idea still holds. Okay? So I told you, <coughs> um, I told you, the first way to start thinking about how to do that last time, um, we can evaluate J of alpha pretty easily. Let me stick with my superscript alpha notation. We can evaluate that with just forward simulation, right? If you want to know how to change alpha, then it helps to know 
um, the gradients, partial j, partial alpha, evaluated it at the current alpha, yeah? I told you one way to do that last time with an adjoint method. Which I still can't resist calling um, back prop through time because that's, I learned it first as a neural networks uh, guy. And there's a second way to do it, which, um, which in some cases is not less efficient, but it's certainly easier to derive and easier to code. So I want to do that to make sure we have um, the intuition about it too. It's also useful. Um, again, this is the neural network name for it. There's probably a good name from more standard optimization theory, but um, in neural networks, people call it real-time recurrent learning. which is RTRL, and this is BPTT. Okay, so how do we compute um, J of alpha, right? The adjoint method we told you that, uh, I told you that if you simulate the system forward in time, um, you get the, the sort of forward equation, you figure out J, if you then simulate the adjoint equation backwards in time, I called it y, y dot is some function going backwards. You can t interpret y as being the sensitivity of changing, um, so y, let, me, let me just write down the form of it quickly. So we, um, the adjoint, remember, was x dot equals f of x going forward. I write down the right equation for you going backwards. And then um, negative y dot is uh, f of x y minus g of x t, where those are the big gradient matrices I, I wrote down last time, going backwards. And then the update gives you um, that partial j, partial alpha is just a simple integral now. Okay, so this backwards um, equation, which happens to be the adjoint equation we saw in Pontryagin's minimum principle, Y has an um, interpretation as the sensitivity of the cost on changing X. Y at, t at, some, at some time T, Y at time 3, is the, it's the same size, the same dimension as X, this Y variable. Okay, it's a column vector just like X. It has the interpretation, it's the, the sensitivity of J on changing X at that time. Okay? So you compute forward, then you compute back the, the gradient of J with respect to X of T. And then knowing that, you can simply compute the other, the, the full gradient with respect to the alpha. Okay, and that took a little bit of derivation the, through the Lagrange multipliers. Um, RTL RL is actually even simpler. Is that okay if I, if that wall disappears for a minute? We wrote that last time, right? It's gonna, gonna go to my third wall here. This time I'm only going to simulate forward in time, which is why it's called real-time recurrent learning because people think, you, you know, some people don't like having to simulate forward to capital T and then simulate all the way back to make an update. It's sort of, you have to go all the way to the end of time in order to make your update at time two. It's more appealing if you can make your update at time two by just thinking about time zero to two. So you can do it in a forward pass only. Uh, the, the name came from maybe that's, um, I think, it, um, 
at one point in time, someone maybe thought maybe this is what the brain's doing because people thought the brain can't be doing these backward passes, right, efficiently. So maybe real-time recurrent learning is what the brain's doing, but I don't think people really think that anymore. That was, there was one paper that thought that, which was a nice paper, but. <clears throat> so let's do, let me just show you RTRL because it turns out to be maybe even the more, um, the more simple thing. Okay, so um, I have J um, of alpha starting from x0. Zero, zero is the integral from t. Oops. Let me do that again. Let me come up with a, a new um, working variable. This, the previous one, y, was, was useful coming backwards. If we're going to go forward, let me define a matrix P where the ijth element is partial xi, partial alpha i. Okay. If I have that and I want to take gradients with respect to this, then I can do it pretty easily, actually. If I want to do partial j partial alpha, it's just, I can go inside the integral, it's just dt, and just using my chain rule here, I get partial g, partial x, partial x, partial alpha, right? These are x at some time t, plus partial g, partial u at time t, partial pi, partial alpha. And in general, if I have a feedback term in my policy, I'm also got to worry about partial g, partial u, partial pi, partial x, partial x, partial alpha. It's just a chain rule derivative of this, you agree? Turns out using those matrix, um, you know, the matrices we had used before, I can write that very simply as uh, integral from zero to t of gx, the big derivative of x times p, this matrix here, plus the big derivative of g on alpha. Right, if we, can, if we know partial x of t, partial alpha, then it's, it's easy, okay? So how do we get partial x t partial alpha? Well, that's easy too. Let's look at the forward equation here x u, which is, in this case, pi alpha x of t, right? So let's look at the, how those, this changes with alpha, right? Let's take the derivative with respect to alpha. I'll write it even more cleanly. Partial f, partial x. Plus partial f, partial u, um, partial pi, partial x, times p, which is partial x, partial alpha, right? right it that chain rule? No? Okay, ask. Yeah. So there we have uh, g with respect to x and then p i g time and then we have g of alpha which will be the second term. Mm -hmm. What happened in the third term? Uh, g, g of x is actually um, partial g partial x plus partial u, g partial u partial pi partial x. Oh, I see. Right? That's the big gradient with respect to x. This is now the matrix uh, P. 
Oh, thank you. That should be a J on the bottom. Good. Thank you. Please do catch me on those things. Yeah. Thank you. OK, so then, then, then are we happy with this? Yeah? So this is pretty simple, too. I just Now I get a, an equation forward in the gradients p dot, right, is my big f of x, which again is partial, the direct and the indirect um, gradient with respect to x times p plus the gradient of f with respect to alpha. Yeah? And that's it, right? I'm almost waiting for more to do, right? But so, if you're willing to go, if you want to go forward in time, then um, if you're willing to keep around this extra term, partial p, um, or sorry, partial x, partial alpha, then as you move forward in time, you can you can build up your gradient of partial j, partial alpha, right? And by the time you get to the end of time, you don't have to go backwards again. You know what the total derivative is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what, why would you use this versus the other method? Is everybody okay with that? Sort of, I, I don't see uh, big smiles, but uh, this is satisfying and simple, right? Smile. Um, the cost of this is carrying around this matrix. Right? So potentially that could be big if you have a lot of parameters. Let's say I have a 100 parameters in my control system or 10,000 parameters in my control system, then you're actually integrating forward a matrix equation that could be pretty big. Right? It's something that's x, the dimension of x by the number of parameters. So that's one, that's really the only problem with it. Okay? The back prop through time. Is more is is only carrying around this y, which is the size of x. But to do this sort of nice forward backward update, you'd better be able to remember um, the trajectory that you've taken that x has taken over time. So for very long trajectories, it might not be much more efficient to do this. Um, it's just a trade-off. Some problems are, are actually quite um, nicely done in an RTRL. Some are nicely done with with backwrap through time. The, the backdrop through time is, the, the reason it's so beautiful and clean is that, um, so remembering, um, so, so your goal of here is to compute a vector, right? Partial j, which j is a scalar with respect to a vector of parameters, right? Here you have to carry around a matrix to do that, partial x forward, right? The backdrop through time takes advantage of the fact that at the end of time, everything collapses to a scalar again. And that's why it only has to sort of carry backwards. If you're willing to go all the way to the end of time, you can remember only the, the effect of that scalar value, j, with respect to the x's. So that's why you're allowed to carry around less of this, OK? But it involves going forward and backwards, OK? Is that intuitive? Yeah? What, what can I say more? There's various other reasons why you might prefer one or the other. So for instance, um, let's say you have a, a final, a boundary condition. Let's say your, your um, cost function, your, you want to solve this constraint, this, this, minimize this function subject to the constraint that x of capital T is my goal. Right, you can write that constraint into either of them. I find it more natural to write it into this, the RTRL form just because you know explicitly partial x, partial alpha. So if you want to compute at the end your constraint derivatives, saying what should I have done, how should I have changed alpha in order to enforce that constraint, then it's actually a simple function of p. So I, I, maybe I'm not giving you a silver bullet telling, by telling you one way or the other, but depending on exactly the way you want to use them, sometimes one is more useful than the other. 
Okay? So in the simulations I'm about to show you, I'm going to actually use RTRL just because it's also, this is trivial to, to code. Okay? Okay, so, so, but the big idea here is really just that I'm doing a shooting method. I'm simulating the thing forward, and I'm trying to compute what's the change in that s my scalar cost with respect to a change in my parameters so that I can then update my parameters. And last time we talked about multiple ways to do that. You might do that with a simple gradient descent algorithm, right? You could do gradient descent. You could say that alpha um, at the n plus 1 step is just alpha n minus some learning rate, eta, times partial j, partial alpha. And I argued last time that you can do better than that by sequential quadratic programming to the point where SQP methods are so robust that you just find something like snopped. You download it and you use it. And I'll try to convince you as, the, uh, as we run some of these things that apart from installing a package, which takes a few, few minutes, uh, once you do it, you'll never go back to this. Okay? I'll tell you one reason right off the bat. Choosing the learning rate is a pain in the butt. Yeah? You never have to do it again. Sold? <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see some examples. Um, let me do the pendulum with snopped. Okay, so, um, so using snopped is just all you do is you tell it, you give it a function which can compute j and j, the, der the derivatives of j. It's, so snopped stood for sparse nonlinear optimal or uh, optimization. And uh, um, in a lot of problems, uh, all, many elements of this vector, partial j, partial alpha, are zero. Okay, we're going to see that in our direct co-location methods. They're very, there's a lot of the method, a lot of those gradients are zero. It happens in the one I just told you. Um, this is a typically not, the, the, typically all of those elements of that vector are, uh, are non-zero, which means I'm not actually getting an advantage by using the sparse NPSOL is the non-sparse version, but I don't think it's much worse, if, if, if any worse. Okay, just for those of you that are trying to figure out which package you want to convince your uh, PI to, to buy, I think Snopped is normally pretty, pretty good. Um, okay, so, and there's a student version uh, that we can have you download that'll do small problems. Okay, so let's do the, the pendulum. Um, my cost function here, uh, It's just an LQR cost, yeah? I have Q is a, I have J is the integral from zero to capital T of X minus the X goal. I had to be careful about wrapping, but transpose Q X minus X goal plus U transpose R U, whole thing DT, right? And I actually also have a final value cost um, where um, Q is 10, 1, QF is 100 times that or something. Q and R is uh, 100. So it's going to reward the thing for getting to the top, right? Let's see what it does. I'm going to plot um, the trajectory for every step of the optimization. 
Okay, so it's not quite doing simple gradient descent. It's now going to do a sequential quadratic programming update where it estimates the quadratic bowl and tries to jump right to the minimum of the bowl. So it's going to be a little bit more jumpy as you see it, but it's fast. It's finding the last optimization and then boop, right to the top. Yeah? Question. So sure. how is this trajectory parameterized? Is it, is it just open loop? It's exactly this, the floor of, the, of t over dt. My sloppy notation was because it's MATLAB notation. Right? Okay. So what is the space of policies that you That's the, the open loop policy, which, is, uh, which had u at time t was just, I do a floor and I go to the to the nth index in alpha. So alpha 1 is my control action from 0 to dt. So how many parameters in this case? Yeah. So um, I did 2 seconds covered by 40 bins. I bet if I do 20 bins, it's OK. It might be a little less faithful to the less smooth, but it works out. Okay. Yeah, it's fast. I mean, so please realize that like 60% of that time was just drawing those plots to the screen easily, easily, right? Um, okay, and it's just, especially when it's reshaping the screen and stuff like that. That's wasted time. Okay, so. Um, Hey, we could do the same thing on the cart pole, right? Can we do this without this time to time? Good question. Yes. So, um, yes, it's quite simple. In direct collocation, it's really simple. So why don't I? I so I actually, my implement, my code does it for direct collocation and doesn't do it for for the gradient, but it's actually quite fine. You just have to have t as one of your parameters tucked into alpha and be able to compute partial j partial t, which is not very hard, actually. If you just have to, you just have to figure out, um, you know, how this function changes when you add, when you take a derivative with respect to t, and it's it's just, it's like an x dot times the quantity j at t. It's not too bad. Yeah. If you can take that gradient, you can you can optimize with respect to it. Okay. So what about for the cart pole? Yeah. Oh. Oh, I forgot I took off the zooming, so it's, it's, uh, I gave it a fixed axis. It's going to make a liar out of me. This is the slowest I've seen. There it is, right? Can I, uh, let me do that again. It's normally more impressive than that. Starting from random initial tapes, by the way, and every time I've run it, it comes up with the same, for the cart pole, it comes up with the same solution. Come on. There we go. Right? Not quite as impressive as it was in the lab, but, uh, but that's still pretty good. Yeah. If I turn off drawing, I bet it's a lot faster. So turn off drawing. There we go. 
You know, I think my computer's slower on battery power too. That's probably, <laughs> that's my, 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 I'm disappointed. Oh well, it's still pretty fast. Okay. Um, good. So, yeah. So I was just wondering, well, if you simulated longer, would it stay at the top or would it fall down? Um, So I actually put a final value constraint in on that. So it actually gets to zero, zero. So because I'm simulating, it probably would stay up, right? Um, but I think a natural thing to do would be to, to throw an LQR controller in on the top, for instance, right? And in fact, we're gonna talk on Tuesday about how to LQR stabilize that whole trajectory. Because for the most part, I think open loop is just the first piece of the, it's just, a, just one of the tools, okay? <laughs> um, good. So what happens if we did, uh, um, you can do the Acrobat too. I'll do the Acrobat in a second here. But, um, so I also have the sort of simple gradient descent version in here. That if I just did my um, alpha equals negative eta times dj d alpha in there. Let's see how that does. Is that faster? <laughs> That's too bad. Okay, let me try that again. That's not running. I didn't save it. I knew that was too good to be true. Okay, my errors are too big. I probably have to change my learning rate. Thereby confirming my complaint that Okay, so it works, right? But never do it again. You don't need to. Just download Snopped. Okay, it'll get there eventually. You can see the errors going down. And if I, you know, set my learning rate properly, it'll go down pretty fast, but not fast enough for me to be patient. Right, and then Here's the snap version again. Oh, the pendulum is very fast. Okay. Good. Um, let me do um, direct collocation before we get too mystified by the simulations. There's another idea. Um, so, so shooting methods can, are, are certainly subject to local minima. And I've got an example that I'll, I'll show you in a few minutes um, that I hope will make that clear that uh, why they can be subject to local minima. Um, <clears throat> something that people do, um, they do sometimes multiple shooting methods. Sometimes it's sort of, um, there's even numerical sensitivity sometimes sort of, of integrating this thing for such a long time. So a lot of times people will define some breakpoint in the middle of their, some artificial breakpoint in the middle of their um, trajectory and say I'm gonna optimize first, try to get me to this point, and then I'll say if I simulated from some other point to here, and then use as a constraint in their optimization to try to make that residual go to, to, to zero. If that makes sense. I'm just, I'm not gonna talk about multiple shooting, but just know that um, there's a version that people use often, which are the multiple shooting methods. To some extent, direct collocation is maybe the, the extreme of that, right? Um, I told you there's a lot of good reasons to use SNOPT or, or some SQP, okay? So, so first of all, um, you know, what, I use snapped, um, no learning rate tweaking. That's a big one for me. Um, it's often faster convergence. Because you're doing, you know, big steps. 
you can sometimes jump over small local minima. Okay, but there's a big one in there that's not on the list yet. What's the big one? I'm going to say. What's perhaps the, the best reason, I think, to use snubbed? Constraints. Good. It's easy to add constraints. Because the way these sequential programs are solved are with these interior point methods and things like this, and they're, they're very efficient at handling constraints. Okay? So in my um, pendulum swing up on the simple gradient descent, I didn't actually have a final constraint on getting to the top. In the snopped version, it's just trivial to add that. Okay? I can put bounds on my actions very easily. I could say that do gradient descent, but never let um, u at time t be better, bigger than 5. Right? I can even I can even put constraints on the trajectory if I wanted to. Okay. So because of the power of nonlinear optimization to handle constraints, people came up with a different way to hand um, the optimal control problem to an SQP method that that exploits those constraint solving abilities a little bit more explicitly. And that's the direct co-location methods. Please, yeah. Um, when we were talking about this previous case that you showed, um, isn't it just providing the cost function that we've provided the Qs and R would be sufficient to actually get a pendulum to the top? So if you add a hard constraint on top of it that we want it to be to, on the top, isn't it sort of like a cheating with respect to other methods? Um, because the goal that we have essentially is maximize or minimize the, the cost that we have over the trajectory. We can like put some constant, like it would be more information, right? Like for example, I want to reach this state or that state for sure. Uh, without just specifying the cost or yeah. associated with that. So I think that's a very RL way to think about it, right? Um, not cheating. I mean, cheat. Cheating is good. If you can hand more information to your algorithm, do it. Don't worry about cheating. But, but no, I, I agree. No, let me adjust. So the question was, is it fair to give it a final get value constraint? Or am I comparing apples and oranges, roughly, right? Am I, if I say one is not using the final value constraint and the other one is. So in my opinion, the goal is actually to get there at time t, right? The optimal control problem I'd like to solve is minimize some, even, um, even minimizing um, just u transpose R u dt subject to x of t is my goal. That might be my favorite way to write it down, right? Um, and then just the question is, what methods can I use to, to, to solve that? So the opposite view of the world here, maybe, is that because a lot of the methods don't handle these constraints explicitly, I'm stuck writing down a cost function, which is x transpose qx plus u transpose R u, right? Even if that's not explicitly what I want, or or maybe, maybe I should say, um, especially the closest analogy is if I have a final value cost, right, right, and maybe I make QF really big. The only question is, what do you really want to do? In most cases, I really want to do that. So I'm I'm quite happy to um, use solvers which could do either case. Right? I think a more powerful solver is one that can handle either case. The other question is, if we want to solve something which takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Like T is relatively big. Yep. It seems that, uh, that the, this open loop policy thing that you're following has one parameter per time step. Yep. Could have a lot of parameters. Right. Good. Uh, but is it possible to like just describe the whole policy with a very limited space with like a very few parameters and then solve for that? So I tried to be careful to write down the equations. So the question was, um, can people hear the question or not? The question was roughly that, uh, um, that if you're worried about a problem with a very long horizon time, it seems that I might have to have a very large list of parameters to cover, to make a tape that's that long, right? And so aren't the algorithms rather inefficient there? Wouldn't, couldn't I do better by writing down maybe a feedback policy, right? That's often the case is that feedback policies can be more compact, right? So I tried to write down all these equations um, uh, as if 
there was some dependence on, on x in your policy too. So, you, so the equations will be the same if you do that version. The only thing that I don't handle nicely in the, the things I'm throwing up on the board is that I'm always simulating from the same x0. So I'm really explicitly optimizing, even if I optimize a feedback controller, from a single initial condition. It's performance from a single initial condition. So you can quite easily say, make, um, you know, make a different cost function, which is, let's say I want j to be the sum of my performance from initial conditions, you know, of, you know k through 100. And this would be, say, j of x k 0 or something like this, right? Maybe I could, I could start it from 100 of my favorite initial conditions. And that would try to optimize a, a, a feedback policy perhaps better. Um, but the, o the only thing that's not nicely addressed, I think, is, is choosing your initial conditions in a nice way. DP, dynamic programming handles that beautifully. And these things are much more local methods. So they have to be in there. But I absolutely agree. Oftentimes, the um, um, open loop tapes are not a, not a particularly sparse way to parameterize a policy. Mm -hmm. Good. So the direct co-location methods, like I said, they more explicitly, they're even more in the sense of open loop policies versus feedback policies, actually. And they're, but they also more explicitly add these constraints, OK? So um, here's the idea. Let's make my alpha my vector that I'm trying to optimize over, a list of, can I call it sort of u0, u1, u2? Is that a, that's another reasonable way to describe what I've already done, right? To u capital N. I've got a list of control actions, right? But now I'm going to actually also, I'm going to augment my parameter vector with the, the state vector, OK? So I'm just going to make an even bigger uh, parameter vector. Okay. One of the reasons to do that is I can now evaluate j um, of alpha, which is this 0 to t g of x. Maybe I even I approximate it with this discretization, right? So um, You can have a DT in there or not, doesn't matter to me. <clears throat> if I have U and X and all these things directly in my parameter vector, I don't actually need to simulate in order to evaluate that. I can just evaluate it immediately, right? I have X and I have U. The only problem is that how do I pick um, alpha so that X and U are consistent? Right? It better be the case that x1 looks like you know, the integration of x0 with, with u0 applied had better get me to x1. So instead of having that sort of implicit in my equations, let's make it an explicit constraint. So let's do this, so this subject to the constraint that x of n plus 1, actually lots of constraints, right? So it's a list of constraints, x1 it better be um, f of x0, u0 times dt, let's say. It better be equal to 0. Right? And so on. And x2 So if I'm willing to add representation here, I can actually evaluate my cost function without explicitly simulating. That's cool. I can take gradients very quickly, because now it's just explicitly the gradients partial g partial x. Well, I know x, right? <coughs> Would you also want x1 minus f of x0, u0, dt minus x0? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, so 
plus, thank you. Uh, yeah? Good, thank you. I had some weird mix of discrete time and continuous time floating around there. Okay, so you can, yeah, if you parameterize it like this, um, you can very efficiently calculate the gradients. For instance, uh, whereas you can, you can easily calculate the gradient with respect to time in this parameterization. And you just add a lot of constraints to your solver. And you're, and you're asking your solver to solve for a lot more points. Right? Turns out that, I mean, these, these, these solvers handle constraints very efficiently. In fact, it, it's oftentimes more efficient to add constraints to the system because it, it reduces the search base. Okay, so this is actually quite fast. The only criticism of it, oh, and there's another thing, nice thing about it, is that um, you can sort of, I'll show you what I mean by this, but you can sort of initialize this um, in ways that hop out of other local minima. So if I, let's say I just choose my initial conditions in the previous um, simulations, I just always just chose u0 to un to be some random, small random number. So the, the pendulum in, in the first thing would just shake here a little bit, and then it quickly changed until it swung up to the top. I can pick x perhaps more intelligently. It won't have satisfied this constraints in the initial case, but I could choose an x, let's say, for the pendulum, let's say my initial guess at x would be a direct trajectory that goes straight up to the top. Okay. If I start searching now for alphas that are um, that minimize this cost and satisfy those constraints, it just puts me in a different sort of area of the search space, and it might actually help me find the swing up policies. It's a very sort of heuristic thing to say, but it makes a big difference in practice. I find. Okay. So direct. I think most people today actually use these direct collocation methods for trajectory optimization. The only, yeah, Rick. Okay. Yeah. Um, are you worried that this would change? The constraint matrix would change? Well, the size of the alpha, right? You get x0 to mm. say. Okay, so, so. Just one time short. Okay, so that's not, I don't do it that way. Um, in, in my code, I do it, um, I say that this is um, valid from 0 to t over n, let's say, right? And this one is used from, you know, t over n to 2t over n, so on. So it just stretches out. So the, the dt is not constant, right? I use that same action for longer if my t stretches out. And that keeps the parameter vector constant. Yeah, but um, I think I think sort of if you were to purchase a Dirk Hall, this is often shorthand as Dirk Hall, direct collocation Dirk Hall, and uh, there was a Dirk Hall package that you could get in Fortran, you know, ten years ago or something that I think a lot of people used, and I think those do things like it stretches out time, and then if DT gets ridiculous, it adds some more points, and then you know, a, a more polished software package would do these things like adding parameters and then reinitializing, reseeding the optimization. Mine doesn't. <coughs> okay. Um, should I show you how it works? Is that I mean, is that the best thing to do here? Uh, it's a pretty simple idea. The the part that I can't really express to you efficiently in, in here is is why that this is uh, uh, something that the solvers can do very well. I can tell you that it's a, it's about how SQPs do in. Um, interior point methods, but but I don't want to get into that. So I think if you just sort of take it on faith that they're good at handling constraints, I think it's reasonable to think that maybe sending in an over uh, over defined trajectory and allowing it to sort out the constraints is a reasonable thing to try. And in practice, let me tell you that it's it's pretty fast. So um, so can I do the pendulum uh, der call now? Okay. Whoop. Okay, so that one was fast before. Now you notice the time horizon here, 3.06. Yeah, so that's what it wanted to be doing. It liked 3.06 better than 2. 
So maybe my other ones would work better if I if I put three in there. Um, okay, so can we do the someone called for the acrobat before? Dirk call on the acrobat. Oh, I should turn off the plotting. Sorry. Let's see what happens, but. It's also got this final value constraint. That's why it, it quickly got to the goal to satisfy that constraint. And now it's making sure that all the dynamics that these trajectories are, um, are satisfied and then it's just optimizing within that constraint manifold, yeah? I didn't really mean to, I'm afraid to hit control C, it might crash. That's the one thing about snap being a max package calling Fortran. Stop. Now my GUI's gone in, my code's gone great. Oh, okay, good. Um, and it got to the top. No, that's the pendulum, sorry. It's cheating. Um, Okay, so turning off printing, just run Dirk all for a second here. How easily these methods can be extended to stochastic case? I think they're heavily tuned to the deterministic case. I, I, won't, I won't make a blanket statement saying they can't be um, extended, but yeah, even the feedback, I, I really think these, the direct collocation in particular feels very specialized for open loop trajectory optimization. It's slower than I remember. Oh, it gets there. Yeah, John. Is there a reason why you need to have U's in your parameter vector and not like feedback policy parameters? And you can evaluate the U given the X and the feedback policy parameters to try to mess up the strength. I think you could do that. Yep. Yeah, I think the key thing is parameterizing the policy as well as, as X, but I think you're right. If you did some handful of W's, or alphas there, sorry, um, then yeah, I think you could probably do that too. Yep. I mean, implementing this constraint is uh, the only real criticism that people have of direct collocation methods. Almost everybody uses them, it seems. The only criticism that they have is that they, they sort of this fixed step integration in here, the constraint being satisfied, it's hard to do sort of an ODE solver in that step because you need to be able to take the, the, the gradients of your constraint. So they tend to be fixed step integration routines, roughly. And so the accuracy, if, if people point to the, a problem with direct collocation methods, they uniformly say that they're not as accurate as the shooting methods because you don't actually numerically simulate your system carefully. Right? You've picked some time discretization of the system and you get it right for that, okay? But I, I don't think that's a big deal, actually. I, and if they're fast and they um, get out of local minima, then, you know, worst case, solve it this way and then do a sh little shooting method at the end to, to finish the optimization, if you like, okay? Um, all right, one more time. John and I were talking before class that there's really no reason why you couldn't compute the gradients of an ODE update inside here. Well, how would you do that? You'd do it exactly like we did the shooting method, right? You could sort of run a little, to compute the gradients of your constraint, you could actually do the adjoint method or the RTRL method to compute those gradients. And then that puts you somewhere in the land between direct colligation and multiple shooting. I'm, I swear that my laptop must be operating at like half, half a brain right now because this is much faster than lab. Um. Uh, 
I'm not connected to the power, right? If you go to the battery, I guess it switches to energy saving. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I should turn. I can probably turn it off right now. Um, so that was a slightly different trajectory. That's just graphics, though. Yeah. I, I'd be ex exceptionally embarrassed if I plugged it in or changed the power settings that it was still slow. So let me just say that it was faster and live, and we'll leave it like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, OK, let me just make the point of, do people understand how a problem like this, we sort of saw a demonstration right there, if you could re sort of remember in your head uh, what the Acrobat did the first time and the second Acrobat did the second time. They both got to the goal pretty well. They took slightly different trajectories, at least to my eye. Um, and so, so one of the complaints about any of these trajectory optimization methods is they're only local methods. Right? We're only going to find a local um, optima in my optimization. Okay, now, for me, <laughs> think about these problems a lot, it's still not completely intuitive how you, what you think of a local minima in these settings might be. Um, okay, there's some places where it could be pretty intuitive. So the pendulum, you can imagine if I, if I found one policy that pumped up with you know, one pump, you could imagine it might be hard to, to sort of get over a cost landscape so you did two pumps to get up. Right? That could be a, um, a, a case where a local minimum makes sense. Um, I tried to come up with a little bit more um, obvious of an example here. Let me, um, relating to the, the original grid world stuff we did. Okay, so now um, this isn't so much a dynamics problem, but I thought maybe a path planning problem would make the point. So here's a random um, geometric landscape, yeah, with Gaussian bumps that you try to avoid or you incur cost. I'm actually plotting the cost landscape as a function of x. So you see there's a small hill which is trying to take me down to the goal in red. Can I turn the lights all the way down for a minute here? Okay, it'll be dramatic this way. Um, so, so there's a goal here in red, and let's say the initial conditions are over there in green, and your task is to take the system, which is x dot equals u, where x is, is the x, y position of this, and u is a, you know, the velocity in x, the velocity in y. Okay? So you just a, a trivial dynamical system, but you're trying to find a path that gets you to the goal with sort of minimal cost. Okay? So I did this example just because, well, people, some people care about this kind of example, but, um, but also because I think it's sort of critically obvious uh, how you could have local minima, right? If I get a trajectory that's on one side of the mountain and maybe the best, the optimal, globally optimal trajectory is on the other side of the mountain, it might be hard for me to get across the mountain to that trajectory. So let's just see that happen. Let me um, show you direct co-location here. Uh, what did I implement? Good. OK, so um, I forgot to type. So I just did direct co-location, and really quickly it found this. So this is not the optimization software's fault. What if I do this? Okay. Yeah, so it found some nice path through the foothills here. Um, to the to the goal, right? That looks that looks like yeah. Please. Can you try to like specify some of those, like, since you have the x parameterized? Um, yep. Can you you know try to make it go through a particular you know set of bumps by specifying that? So so exactly. So the so the reason I chose to do direct location for this is my initial guess u was just some random vector, but my x was actually a direct line from start to the goal. So if you had drawn it, you know, as a line between those first two and then going around to... Good. You know, yep. The so the one, I, the one I thought to do was, let's just do, just because it was easy to type, let's do an initial x which just goes directly this way. Uh 
and then see what happens. I think that's what I had here. So, so if I change my x, my x tape here is now um, lin space, you know, so it interpolates in x0 straight to the goal, but then the other one is just x1 straight across. Reading MATLAB code is not what you want to do in class here, but uh, if I set the initial x tape to be that, um, and I run it again, Doing it's solving. It's probably doing it in some window. Oh, I turned off animation, didn't I? Oops. That was a failure. But it found a different path. Okay, but it actually told me warning exited. So I have this, you know, check page 19 of Gil 06, the paper. Um, to figure out what the heck exit 41 means, but uh, uh, it basically couldn't satisfy the constraints. So that, I bet if I just run it again with random initial conditions, it'll be okay. Okay, but the point is exactly this. So I still found one that's just, it, it probably didn't satisfy some of the constraints at some, some small part of that trajectory here. It went the other way around the mountain, yeah? Okay, so there are local minima in these problems, okay? In problems like this, it's completely obvious why there are local minima. Um, in the Acrobat and things like that, uh, you will find that there are local minima. If you start with different random parameterizations, you'll find slightly different swing up trajectories, okay? Um, uh, so our local minima, a killer, uh, most, a lot of people will say, well, that, that means, you know, these methods stink, you can only, they're subject to local minima. Um, I don't care if they're, if I'm in a local minima for the most part. I mean, so, okay, so if I was really going to have to walk around a mountain instead of walking through the mountains, then maybe I'd care. But if I'm doing an acrobat and it swings up, you know, like this, instead of swings up like this, I, for the most part, I don't care, right? So. Um, in, although people talk about it a lot, I find in most of the problems I care about, local minima aren't that big of a deal. Yeah, they exist sometimes, they can, they can upset your numerics, but eh, as long as you get to the goal, I'm happy. Okay, now, um, there are a couple other ideas in these trajectory optimization. Um, and on Tuesday, I guess I'm going to wait till Tuesday now. I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to tell you how to stabilize these trajectories because it's useless as it is right now. If I just even simulated it with a different DT, it would probably fall, right? Um, or, or not get to the mountain. Um, so, but it turns out even with a pretty coarse um, time step, if you stabilize the thing with feedback, then it works great. Okay, so I'll, I'll show you how to do the trajectory stabilization with an LQR method on Tuesday. And that's actually going to lead to another class of the trajectory optimizers, which would be an iterative LQR method. Okay, and then depending on, depending on how, um, how much I sleep this weekend, uh, I'll try to, I was thinking about doing the, the discrete mechanics version of the trajectory optimizers on Tuesday too. We'll see. So we'll push the walking back until Thursday just to, to complete the story about uh, these trajectory solvers. Any questions? They're pretty good, they're pretty fast, especially if you're plugged into the wall. Okay, see you, see you next week. <laughs>